So, originally this video is going to be this one huge video, but there's just one problem. Tears of the Kingdom is much, much bigger and more ambitious than what anybody expected. That would already make writing this video take a long ass time, but it would also probably destroy my computer to this time. Anyways, this is part one of my most ambitious project that I've ever worked on. This is Tears of the Kingdom Part 1, Mystery of the Zona. A common complaint that I heard that people had with Breath of the Wild story is that there wasn't enough. Most of the story took place a century ago with nearly nothing else going on in the modern times. While Tears of the Kingdom doesn't completely fix every issue, it does improve in most of the areas. A lot of Breath of the Wild's story revolved around the Great Calamity, which isn't a bad thing at all. The story was always meant to be tragic and filled with melancholy. I just believe there wasn't enough time to grow attached and to really get to know the new champions. Before boarding Divine Beast Van Mado, we just had to shoot arrows at targets. That's disappointing as hell. Tears of the Kingdom fixes the lead up perfectly with much, much better missions. My favorite one was Goron City with the Gorons addicted to crack. And Unibo, he was so hilarious. <laughs> Kinda sad that he wasn't like this for the entire game. Tears of the Kingdom takes more risks with its story and while it's more linear this time, I think it's for the best. We get to see more of the current Hyrule that we've never seen before. Of course, the story is helped by the fact that our villain this time is Ganondorf versus Calamity Ganon. While not required, the memories that you can collect through the Dragon Tears gives more backstory to the upheaval and to the new characters that we've seen throughout the game. In addition, now you can physically see where the memories are via a geoglyph which helps Helps a lot with locating them. Look me in the eyes and tell me that I was supposed to know where to go with just this. I always found the memory of Link falling in battle to be tragic and emotional. It showed off how good the game's story could have been, yet yeah, never reached the heights of that again. Age of Calamity did help with getting to know the champions better, but at the same time, it's not a tragedy and it doesn't take risks. In addition to being slightly better, Tears of the Kingdom also does a lot. In Breath of the Wild, the Zonai were a background element, but now, they're the main focus of Tears of the Kingdom. They were always an interesting piece of lore that was never explored further. We still don't see a lot, but we get to see that the Zonai were an incredibly advanced civilization that were mystical. Speaking of the Dragon Tears, these are Tears of the Kingdom's versions of memories that looks into the ancient Hyrule, an unknown amount of time deep in the past. This is where we find out more about the Zonai, with only two remaining. One is Raru, and the other is Mineru. Remember how Zelda is trying to find a way back to modern Hyrule? She fucking fails. Instead, she works alongside Raru and eventually becomes a sage to fight against the demon king Ganondorf. I loved this, and the last time we saw sages in the Zelda franchise was 2012's A Link Between Worlds, over a decade ago. So. In Tears of the Kingdom, each sage has been tasked with taking down Ganondorf as he grows stronger and stronger, thanks to the tear amplifying his power that he stole from Sonya. Even with the power of the sages, the sages failed to take down Ganondorf. Sensing no other ways to stop the Demon King, Raru bravely decides to sacrifice himself, and we see the remnants of this at the opening of the game, with his arm sailing away Ganondorf. Alongside this explaining why there is this weird arm on Ganondorf, this is also a brilliant way to explain the origins of the Calamity, and the malice seen in Breath of the Wild. So, back to ancient Hyrule. With the king and the queen gone, and Mineru severely injured, morale is low. Zelda is able to restore the Master Sword with her light magic, but it would take a long time. An extraordinarily long time. Zelda does the unthinkable, and she gives up. Just kidding. She swallows her tear and becomes a dragon through a process known as draconification. The story is imperfect, but it's moments like this where Nintendo does something new that makes me enjoy the story a lot more. In previous Zelda games, getting the Master Sword was the same boring thing. You just had to go to the Lost Woods and retrieve it. In Tears of the Kingdom though, they changed it and made it so damn cool. You have to retrieve it from Zelda or the Light Dragon and pull it out of her head. So, there's one thing I like to say whenever I'm feeling down, whenever I'm feeling gloomy from No Twilight Princess on the Switch. Tears of the Kingdom is Skyward Sword if it was good. Of course, I'm kidding. Both are two very different games with two very different goals. Though, I will say that Tears of the Kingdom takes the general idea of Skyward Sword and expands on the concept to make it even better than before. 
and I love it. Skyward Sword has islands in the sky, obviously, and an undiscovered world. The problem is that the world in Skyward Sword was extremely linear and disconnected which did hurt a lot as a Zelda fan. In addition, there weren't a lot of islands that were interesting, other than the Great Pumpkin and Skyloft. Breath of the Wild took the original The Legend of Zelda idea and massively expanded on that. I feel like Tears of the Kingdom takes a lot of cues from Zelda 2. In both games, Hyrule has been massively expanded. Both games feel more lived in, with more to do, and both have much better music. While I do find myself disappointed with the fact that there aren't a ton of Sky Islands, it's still a nice addition to the game and built upon the foundations created by Breath of the Wild. In the story, the Sky Islands are really important. In fact, in the story we start out on a Sky Island, called the Great Sky Island, which is the Great Plateau of this game. This is where we learn how to be Link again, and learn our new abilities, which I'll touch on later in the video. We get this amazing opening like Breath of the Wild, but now with Link skydiving into the Great Sky Island. Tears of the Kingdom is great, and thanks to the developers reusing the same base world, it has a lot of different gameplay loops. Whenever I'm feeling tired of the skies, I go to the main overworld. Whenever I'm feeling bored of the main overworld, I go to the depths. And whenever I get bored of the depths, you get it. I would never say that Breath of the Wild is boring, because it's not. But Tears of the Kingdom opens up and lets you do exactly what you want to do. You're able to carve out what you desire. I will say though, that even with all my praise, I do think that Nintendo wasted a lot of potential here with the Sky Islands. They may be another layer in the map, but there's so much empty space. I do realize that the sky is supposed to be empty. I was just hoping for more interesting islands. Instead, we only have really two or three important islands. And that's just disappointing. And from all the marketing that we got, I thought that the Sky Islands were going to be the main part of the game, alongside Hyrule being updated. That isn't the case, and I do hope that if we ever get an expansion pass for Tears of the Kingdom, that we get new areas to explore in the sky with brand new island type. Since Left Wings are in the game, you might wonder how we get from island to island. I mean, it's not like you can fucking fly. Stone Eye vehicles are easily the biggest and the coolest addition that we've ever seen in the Zelda franchise to this point. While this isn't the first time that we've seen vehicles in the franchise, this is the first time that we've been able to fully customize and build our own vehicles. Almost reminds me of another game. Since the upheaval wrecked Hyrule, device dispensers have appeared on Sky Islands and in various spots throughout the world. This is how you can get Zone Eye parts, though it's entirely gotcha. I do wonder why Nintendo's been obsessed with gacha lately. What's next? Fucking gacha in the new Mario game? There's a lot of gears to get in these dispensers. And you don't even need to use them with the Zone Eye vehicles. You can fuse them with shields or swords to get unique effects, like even a makeshift for Volley's Gale. The device dispensers can drop anything from wheels, steering sticks, fans, wings, balloons, dragon heads. What's next? Metroid Prime 4? Ultra Hand and the Zone Eye vehicles are so insane, and you can make anything with the only limitation being your imagination, and the frame rate. I don't use Reddit a lot, but one of my favorite subreddits is Hyrule Engineering, where you can see where people are taking the game and the Switch to its absolute limits. I highly recommend checking it out if you're interested or need ideas for a future Zone Eye build. And I've checked it out a few times since I'm a basic bitch. Both Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom excel in giving you the freedom to do what you want. And in here, you don't have to make complicated machines. You can just cheese and make simple ones or just make a dick machine. In Tears of the Kingdom, we lose everything, from runes, to our hearts, to even our arm. While that might be sad at first, we get brand new runes that completely outclass the originals found in Breath of the Wild. Other than remote bombs, I miss them so much. We get four at the beginning, and a fifth one that builds upon one of them. I'll let my good friend Vento Edo talk about them. By the way, he's also the graphic designer for my YouTube channel who made the thumbnail and the graphics for the room. So please send him some love in the comments down below, please. Something worth bringing up in regards to runes is how they work towards unintended solutions. Ultra Hand itself is already largely flexible in how unlimited you are in the way you can fuse or move. Using whatever you can find to your advantage, fuse lets you create instant methods of elevation through shield fusing, not just through rockets, but bombs as well. Ascend is more situational overall, but when it works in tandem with the other runes, it can get you to places you usually aren't able to get to very easily. And Recall is the most flexible, having insane range of activation, lots of rewind time, and can be used to get past many challenges through how creatively you use it. It makes the game even more replayable because of the many ways you can break or speedrun through shrines and overworld puzzles, and they want you to do so. 
In both Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom, we start out with these special abilities called runes in the opening hours of the game. These runes allow us to interact with the puzzles everywhere in the world. The problem, at least for me, is that in Breath of the Wild, the runes aren't exactly the best. They're not bad, especially with remote bombs being amazing for fishing or for blowing up crates, the runes were very limiting. Magnesis only picked up metal objects, Cryonis only made an ice pillar which was really situational, and Stasis? That's only really good for speedruns, man. Tears of the Kingdom is much, much better in this regard. I feel like this time, you use each rune much more in the three layers of Hyrule. All of the four beginning runes are so helpful and they allow you to interact with Hyrule in amazing ways that we've never seen before. Additionally, there's this really cool new mini boss that fully utilizes each rune to the maximum by making you have to use each one in order to defeat this flux construct. Also, why the fuck do we have a map rune? This is fucking useless. Tears of the Kingdom is a fantastic follow-up to one of the most beloved games ever that expands it in ways I never would have thought. They added so much to Hyrule, made so many changes to pre-existing features to make them all feel refreshing and unique. With the Sky Islands, the deaths, and everything else, this game satisfied me, and I'm really hoping that this isn't the last time we get to see this Link in Zelda. It brought back so many of the elements that made Zelda special, and what made it so beloved in the first place. This is a legendary game that I know will go down as one of the best games ever created, and I can't wait to cover more of it in part 2, coming out later this year.